one of the questions I always ask a person when they come to the studio is I ask them, what do you see? And they look at the hand and it's like 99.9% .9 of the people that come to the studio that say, I see a hand. I'm like, okay, we're going to have to change that. I was born in Montevideo, Uruguay, South America. My parents were Italian immigrants. And I stayed in Uruguay until the age of five. At the age of five, uh, my parents decided to migrate to the United States where at the beginning it wasn't very easy. Um, but before leaving Uruguay, there's, there's an interesting part to this story is that I was born uh, across the street from the art studio of a Uruguayan artist. In the studio he had an academy where he taught. The day we were le leaving to the United States, we left to the United States because my, 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 my parents uh, wanted to seek um, new frontiers and when we were leaving before getting into the car to go to the airport I picked up a drawing and this drawing that I picked up was the face of a man who was dreaming and in that dream there was a limousine there was a beautiful woman there was a lot of money and all that was within this cloud in a dream and I looked at the paper and I said, wow, I would really love to do this. I would really love to draw this way. And it was like a going away gift from life. That drawing stood with me until I started college. I lost track of it. Those things that you, you, you don't give that much importance. You keep, as a child, you keep it, but as you grow up and then it just disappeared but it was enough to say you have to go this way well we used to live at in, in an apartment complex and it was like a melting pot of all cultures people from different nationalities we had um, within our crew there were kids who 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 were really great at sports, others in literature, uh, others in music. And I was the one who always drew and, and drew and drew. But when I started school, my first year was very difficult because I came from a country which I spoke Spanish. And I was in this classroom. I did not understand the language. I didn't know how to communicate in this language, this new language. And I had to use my drawing to basically tell the other people, both teacher and students, uh, what was going through my mind. And drawing from the beginning, I think it all started in first grade. Um, in first grade is when I started to use this drawing and I remember it, when I was alone in my solitude, I would go to this drawing that, that I picked up before leaving my country. And I would look at it and I would draw it and redraw it and redraw it. And never would be the same. I mean, I was a child. I would, would never be the same as, as something that an adult would draw. But um, art was my, my, my way of communicating to my teacher, to my friends, to my students, my, my fellow students. Drawing was the and is the most important way of communication in my life. I think I was about 10 years old, uh, not sure if it was between 9 and 11. Dad shows up one day from work and he had this possibility of, of 
getting a loan and we could actually have our, our first home. We moved into this this beautiful little house, uh, three bedroom home uh, with a backyard and we constructed a shed with that and it was really beautiful and one of the interesting things was that dad worked at the Venezuelan embassy and while working at the Venezuelan embassy he met a friend of which um, this friend he gave him the basement and so he could live in our basement I thought he would be paying rent but he didn't pay rent he was there as a friend and as a way of, of saying thank you to my parents for letting him stay the time that he stayed um, he would see that I, I loved to draw and he took me I, re I remember it was I think it was the head company and we went to the art department and he says I want you to choose whatever here you like and I was like whoa I can't make this guy waste money you know it's and he says I want you to buy things that'll help you start your career I was about 10 11 and I couldn't choose anything I mean I was really shy so he grabbed this box and in the box there were oils and there were brushes and uh, turpentine and linseed oil and a palette I'm like that's too much money he says this is what you deserve so he bought that he bought a sketchbook and he bought pencils when I got home I kind of like felt guilty and I told dad and dad said look he wanted to do this so we have to accept it it's his way of saying thank you um, for all we've done for him. The next day, that was on a Friday, I think it was uh, next day on a Saturday, I went to the backyard and I did everything a future artist should not do. Grabbed four pieces of wood, made a wooden frame, grabbed some sheets. I, I, that, that part was kind of complicated because I had to explain to my mother later that those sheets, um, I needed them for the great work of art I was going to do when in reality the sheets were part of the bed and I stretched the sheets with nails also something that you shouldn't do it wasn't very stretched and I started painting with a canvas or <laughs> sheets that were not primed so the oil will go through the other side and I was like painting trying to see if anybody would see that I was painting because I wanted the world to see that I was an artist and in my backyard there was this man cutting Mr. Conroy he was cutting his lawn and all of a sudden I hear that he stops his machine I'm like wow this guy appreciates art and he was I turned around I looked behind me and there he was watching me paint he goes Ch -ch -ch, calls me and I said okay I'm gonna sell my first painting and he says, what are you doing? And I was like, this guy must be idiot. I mean, he doesn't understand what I'm doing. I'm painting, you know? I didn't say that. I, I remember I felt it inside. That I do remember. So I looked at him and said, I'm an artist. I'm painting. Painting a work of art. Now, he, you have to realize there's this little kid, 9, 10, 11 years old, telling an adult that he already has a profession I mean it was really impressive to see this man not laugh she says can you just keep that thought for a second I'll be right back so he ran into his house got back and he brought a sketchbook with pencils and behind his hand he had something and he says, can you draw me an egg I'm like Wow, this guy has a sketchbook and he has good pencils. It wasn't that number two pencil that we used in school, yellow with the red. No, these were drawing pencils. So I'm like, okay. So I drew an egg and I drew the egg. The egg was so big, it was an ostrich egg. So he grabs the egg from behind his hand. He had, a hit, he had, a, he had his hand in behind his back. 
brings the egg and puts it on top of my egg, I'm like, okay, he's putting an egg on top of my ostrich egg, which my ostrich egg should be a hen egg, and it's not a hen egg. This guy is trying to tell me something. So I looked at him and I said, so? He says, it's a beautiful egg. They're both beautiful eggs, but your egg is not the real egg. I'm like, I didn't understand the concept he was giving me, but he was actually teaching me. I'm like, okay. He says, ask your parents if he can come over to my house. So I talked to my mom and I said, look, mom, neighbor behind asked me if I could go and see some stuff. She says, okay, don't come late and be very respective. I mean, here we are with an Italian mom who respect is first. Both mom and dad, if you didn't respect somebody, boom. Go into this house and I start looking all over and I'm like, oh my God, there are paintings all over the place. I mean, this guy had paintings all over the wall. I'm like, these are nice paintings. It, it was like a museum. Who painted all this? He says, I painted them. You paint? He says, yeah, I paint. I teach at Catholic University in D.C. You teach in a university. I was 10 years old, but I knew that university was an important thing. I mean, we didn't have internet back then, and we didn't talk about, when you're 10 years old, you don't talk about college, you talk about school. College is too far off. So I look at him, I'm like, okay, that's good. He says, I want to show you my studio. So we go into the studio, which is that beautiful studio that any artist wants to have. And I'm like, oh my God, this guy's an artist for real. And I looked at his palette and it was the master's palette. I'm like, oh my God, this guy is for real. I looked at him and I'm like, okay, so I'm not an artist really after all I mean I gave him that look and he looked at me with a smile and he says would you be so kind of to give me your drawing as a gift I'm like you want my drawing he says yeah I want your drawing I said okay give you my drawing you're gonna hang it up with all these beautiful paintings and he's like this is a beautiful drawing he says you know why it's beautiful I said no I have no idea it's just an egg he says this is a beautiful drawing because it's authentic. It's done by you. It's not a copy. It came from your mind. I'm like, wow. He made that drawing seem like something like the Guernica, you know, the Mona Lisa. I'm like, oh my God. He says, I'm going to give you a gift. You give me a gift, I give you a gift. So he goes to the studio, he grabs three uh, tubes of paint and he puts them in a box and he gives me red, yellow, and blue. He says, this is for you. What's this? He says, you have to promise, Scout's Honor, that you will not use this until you're ready. You have to know what red, yellow, and blue are, how they work, and understand color before you use it. you got to promise me. I said, sure, I promise you. I'm Scout's Honor here. And I put tubes away, and I didn't use them until... 14 or 15 years later, when they really came to use. A week later, or 10, 12 days later, I, I would look in the backyard to see if I would see him, but he would never come out. I mean, his, his grass was getting bigger, and he wasn't cutting his grass. So I decided one day, knock on his door, rang the bell, and his wife said, look, my husband passed away. I was... I was a child, didn't understand what, what losing someone was. So I tried to ask her if he left me a note or if, and she just looked at me and she said, my husband passed away. He's no longer with us. Please let me be in peace. And that was it. I mean, he gave me the message he had to give me. During the time we met, we met once and I actually saw my first master's palette.
had a really deep conversation with my, my dad and my mom and I was about almost 11, 12 and I told them, I said, look, I want to become an artist. And I said to myself, I mean, I had it very clear what I wanted, but I wasn't sure if my parents had it very clear. And much to my surprise, both my mom and dad understood me. They understood the necessity to become an artist. The thing is, dad, he worked all day and he was like, and we were, we were really tight economically. And he said, okay, you want to become an artist. How do you plan on paying for your education? You're 11. I said, dad, don't worry. I said, I want to be an artist. That's my responsibility. I just need both your okays. Because I mean, this starts, I was going to end up being uh, an artist all the way. Dad and mom, they looked at me like this is a fantasy. This is something that's just going to pass by. And spring was coming and I had to organize myself. So I said, okay, very good. What happens if I start cutting lawns? So the nearest gas station was really far away and I decided that dad wasn't going to pay for my education and I was going to pay for my, my education, but dad could collaborate with, with the gas. So I would open the cars and I would put this, this hose inside and I would take out the gas and I would go out and cut my neighbor's lawn and at five dollars a lawn I had about 10, 12 clients a week or every two weeks and I started saving. Winter comes around and I look at dad and I'm like, okay, autumn came around, I'm sorry, autumn. I said, okay, I've got this amount of money. I found this place that's willing to teach me. It's the, this, this a Catholic nun and her name was Sister Lillian and it was Devon at the Ceramics, I remember. It was behind a high school. And she had this art studio within the high school. And she was independent. And she would teach me. I had to pay $40 a month and bring my own materials. So I started with her. She was an extremely generous human being. Extremely, extremely generous human being. There was nothing that she did not know that she did not tell me. She taught me everything. And she kind of adopted me as, as her nephew. I remember she would save her, her, her cake from dinner. And when I would come to class, she had it wrapped in a napkin. And when everybody drank coffee, she would open up the napkin. She says, you have to eat. So I would eat the cake. It was, I mean, they made some really good cake. And she began my four months. She was, she was my mentor. She, she was the one who helped me to begin my studies. And that's basically how I started. Uh, Dad would take me, bring me back. But I actually did pay for, and I showed them that it, that that was going to be my profession. I'm entering high school now, and I I decided I wanted to go to college. While in high school, I met a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful art teacher. Her name was Nancy de Blachette, and. She taught me that anything I wanted to be, I could be. There were no obstacles in my way. I mean, the road was free. And if there were obstacles, I had all, I had everything within me to overcome that obstacle. And she helped me 
to begin entering contests and we began working as a team I mean she would find a contest she's like go for this one and then go for this one and we ended up I ended up entering national contests and I won quite a few of them and got the opportunity to go to the Goddard Space Flight Center in, in College I think College Park in Maryland I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure where it's at I'm living in Uruguay now in South America so uh, but it is in Maryland the God, I think it's called the Tracking Goddard well it's the NASA and I got to receive a prize from Reader's Digest which was given to me at the Kennedy Center and I said to myself remember those two big events I'm like wow I got here through my art I'm in the NASA I'm in this 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 contest with all these people who are competing we weren't competing we were within this this art project that NASA had had created and it was one of our paintings where it was, was going to be selected for for the catalog which actually they, they chose mine but they could have chose any one of ours and we did an exhibit within uh, the, the the center and it was a permanent exhibit for for quite a while but I said to myself this is incredible I mean art opens doors and I entered the Scholastic Art Awards a national contest for, for young artists and it really helped me to see what art education is in all of the states I mean all the universities were there I chose to go to a university which was quite close to home which was Maryland College of Art and Design and I finished my my studies and came back to Uruguay 1987 I decided to come back to Uruguay while in college um, I worked at a frame shop on Capitol Hill and I did this as a part-time job and it helped to finance college I ended up at towards the end of my last year of college becoming the manager of the shop once I finished college I was working 14 16 hours a day and one day I decided that um, I wanted to come back wanted to come back to Uruguay that was in 1987 the decision was made uh, the decision was first made by my parents they were coming and I said to myself in this country all alone um, what were my options and one of the options was to start my career in the States the other option was come back in to Uruguay I really I really don't know how I came across the decision but I decided to come back and a few years went by I was with a few addictions on me heavy addictions and decided I needed help and started a treatment the treatment took a while and I began to put order in my priorities I started to see the world in a different way I started to have objectives or, or have my objectives a bit clear and I decided that I wanted to further my studies so I went to what was fine arts here in Uruguay at that time it wasn't part of the university it was part of the Ministry of Education and I presented myself with my college degree but my college degree was was of no good because the, because fine arts wasn't part of the university in 1987 that was a reality so I had three options I could either go back 
to the States. I could start my career again. That was another option. Or I could start my own studio. So I decided to start my own studio. I rented out a place and I started with five students of which one of my students was this woman who's deaf, uh, Alicia, and it wasn't until I met her that I realized that the people that were going to come to the studio were going to be my teachers. They were going to teach me and I was going to learn. I mean, I was not there to teach. I was there to teach art. Yes, that, that's a reality. But at the same time, there was so much I had to learn from each one of the 4,000 students I've had in these past 30 years. And while working with this woman, um, we would go for, forward and back, forward and back. And I would see that she didn't understand very much of how I worked. One of the reasons was I talked too fast. The other reason was that I spoke a sort of Spanglish in Spanish. Um, and when she tried to read my lips, she didn't understand me. So I'm like, okay. So we start, I asked her, I wrote on a paper, do you have any idea of what I'm talking about? And she wrote me back. She says, up to now, I did not, in all these weeks I've been with you, I've never un, uh, kept up with you. I just come because I like it here. I'm like, oh my God. Okay. So she was already drawing, I needed to teach her color, and I started looking at the studio, and it was, I in the studio I, have, I had everything, but I, my oil paints and my acrylics were at home. Well, I'm like, I don't have anything to teach her color, and she has to start with color. So I opened a drawer, and I took out those three colors that Mr. Conroy gave me, red, yellow, and blue. And I started mixing in the palette, and it was really incredible. I started to create what I saw in this man's palette when I was in his studio. He had the palette of a master. I mean, he had it in an orderly way with all the colors. And I'm like, I started mixing the colors, and I realized that there was much more to color. And when Mr. Conroy said, you have to not use this until you understand truly what color is. Once I started mixing, I understood what he tried to tell me. And that's how I started teaching here in Uruguay. And that's how I teach to this day. We only use red, yellow, blue, and white. You don't need anything but that. Those magical tubes that Mr. Conroy gave me kind of like started to talk it, it was they were talking in such a way that it was like I didn't need to explain to her just playing with the colors I was tell, t telling her about the primary secondaries complementaries the, uh, the color perspective and it was like it, it was it, it was all working and when I finished over that palette I was like wow like what what happened you know and it was like then that I realized that I was part of a process I was within what would be a creative process and I was connecting with something that was much higher with a much higher being with an energy that it, it's that energy that flows in everything that is very simple and started to understand it was like concepts and theories and I would I was going through a time of my life where books would show up and we have to understand that in the early 90s there was no internet I mean there, there was no way to google something and life was becoming magical and those magical tubes which were given to me 14 years before and me being born in front of the art studio 
of an artist and I'm like wow we when I start looking back I'm like this is this is this is too much and and these five students each one of them came to teach me something very important so when I started to open myself up and I started to understand the creative process and I started to understand that there's something more to what we call art to me art is 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 a way of connecting with the real creative process which is that process that decides who is born and who dies when it's time to blossom and when it's time to not blossom <laughs> and started connecting with students and it was really incredible at that time how life would send me students but at a rhythm that I could somehow tolerate when I say the word tolerate I'm not saying tolerate because I did I was intolerant if I would have had more students I wouldn't have had the time to learn and that's something that when one looks back you start saying to yourself this is really incredible I mean there was a real 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 being next to me the true master who walked with me and told me how to do things taught me how to do things gave me that space for me to decide how to do it but that master brought to me the students which were masters hidden within students to teach me what I was supposed to teach later on. Um, my studio is a very, very, very magical place. It's a place where things that have to happen will happen but you will discover what the reason is later on on your voyage. Sometimes it, it's difficult to, to explain how we work in the studio, but um, one of the questions I always ask a person when they come to the studio is I ask them, what do you see? And they look at the hand and it's like 99.9% .9 of the people that come to the studio they say I see a hand I'm like okay we're gonna have to change that now a hand looks like something really complicated to resolve but in reality it's because the hand in my mind is a problem why is it a problem because it's something complex it's something rational it actually has a name and it's composed of parts like a square, a rectangle, a semicircle. But if we are able to abstract the hand and give it an abstract form, and it's no longer a hand, but we start seeing other forms, let's say I see an L or a J or a V, and I look at this form here, this finger is no longer a problem because the problem is here. Now, since this is non-rational because I have no images in my mind for this form, I'm going to be obligated to draw it just as I see it. If I draw a finger, what I do is I go back to my memory and what I do is I bring back the finger and I'll draw the same finger I've been drawing ever since I was a kid. So one of the things that we do at the studio is teach people to see the world in an abstract way. If I see the world in an abstract way and I see that the problem is not nothing but a series of solutions, the problem is never a problem because it's the adventure is finding the solutions to resolve that non-problem and that's how the hand is formed.
that's basically the way I teach. I teach people to take away whatever problem they have in their head. All problems are surrounded by solutions. All problems are surrounded by solutions. If I can abstract my, my form of thinking and not think of things as a problem, everything is a solution. My own problem is part of the solution. That's, that's art. I mean, art is, is, is not something complex. Art is something that, that flows in a world where there are no problems. Everything gets resolved. That's life. We as rational people, we put in our minds concepts that are very difficult to understand because they're rational. And we don't use emotion because the rational part makes the emotional part kind of like have a short circuit. And it's like we become people who go through crisis. And in reality, if I could just tell my rational part and say, look, let me do what I have to do, all will get done. And if it doesn't get done exactly like this, it doesn't matter, it doesn't look 100%. The important thing is that I did it. And that, my friend, is no repression. When you don't have repression within it, uh, your essence flows. That's my art studio. What we express on the canvas, in essence, is who we are. The work of art is like a magical mirror which shows you what is really going on within you. The fact that you struggle or not struggle with the work of art, within that creative process, what you're actually doing is confronting your reality. Art is a way of making a voyage inward. The result is the work of art. For me, the studio is, is a magical place where everything is in harmony um, from the moment that there is chaos. When we're in the middle of chaos, trying to find that, that, that point in harmony within a group, within oneself, within the work of art, that is basically the, the, the essence of being in the studio. At the beginning of the classes, uh, when you start to see how people come to uh, the class, uh, somebody comes overly excited, some, uh, th there's another one who comes uh, a bit depressed, and another one who's a bit stable. Once we begin working and each one starts on his or her individual work, when that creative process begins to move within the, the easels and you see that towards the end and at the end of the class there is a total harmony. Um, the creative process was, was done the way it should have been done. Nature is non-rational. Nature flows. Um, when we work on a piece and we work in a gesturally matter, um, the fact that you're gesturing within a work of art um, and you're flowing through that piece non-stop you're actually in the creative process. When we study nature, when we go into nature, we see that nature actually does. It doesn't detain itself to think. It just does. The creative process is, is, is something that, that should flow in a constant matter. Thing is, when the rational concepts come down and they decide to overtake the work of art and, and, and the conflicts begin, it, that's when, when the artist begins to struggle. 
the creative process is is interesting when you see it in nature it just flows to understand the simplicity of how it works it takes years of training uh, years of, 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 of actually learning to see what reality is when you're able to see reality in an abstract form and you're actually seeing reality as an abstraction of reality because reality is reality whatever you do within your work is an abstraction of reality that's when you're in the process the art studio is like a family um, basically everybody that comes into the studio um, knows a lot about my family my life uh, my wife Carolina my kids Bruno and Diego and I basically know a lot about their family we are family uh, we are family during the time we're in the studio we are family from the moment we see each other's in different types of event outside the studio um, but we are family because we are brothers and sisters in this big space that we call planet and we celebrate birthdays uh, we celebrate weddings what are the difficulties I find in this process difficulty is letting go is letting that student that's been here uh, training for the time that he has to trade um, when we both decide that the apprenticeship has come to an end and it's time to put an end to this part of his life or her life and understand in a mature way that this is not an end but a beginning to a new stage it, the person that leaves the studio um, sometimes because of guilt they stay on and guilt has nothing to do with this I mean we have to be adults and we have to realize that uh, within our process there's a beginning a middle and an end when you come to that end which in reality is, is, is part of a new beginning you're actually giving space for someone else to come and occupy your space so if I do do the process right and realize that my time is up here but that doesn't mean it's actually up I mean the time at the studio is up I mean now it's time to go on and begin your life as 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 an artist create your own master's palette what has art given me well first of all a beautiful wife uh, Carolina she's my co-pilot uh, two wonderful kids Bruno and Diego um, I think it doesn't matter what work of art I will work in within the future I've done before there is no work of art more beautiful than either one of the, my two kids I mean they are perfection they are my best works of art I, I, our best works of art because I didn't create it on my own I didn't create them on my own um, the art world has given me the possibility to meet some extremely talented people of which uh, each one of those people that have come in contact with me both students and colleagues of which all are masters teachers each one of those people has left a teaching within me that I think I would have never ever seen it with the eyes that I see it now if I would have if I wouldn't have been within the art world 
the art world has 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 opened my eyes understanding that abstraction is not really abstraction abstraction is simply reality reality seen in a different way when i see reality i i just see rational concepts i see dogmas i see ways of thinking that people have said look you have to think this way but when i learn to think and see through the eyes of an artist and look through those abstractions and resolve complex problems through their solutions which are around them um, i see that every person that has come in contact with me from the beginning of my life has been a crucial piece to this great puzzle i call life um, that's that's i think more than anything art has taught me to see my life the world and the people that surround me in a completely different way. Concept here of the art studio is um, we. I I always use the word we because I I think that we as a group are one. Um, when we talk about the master's palette, there's a reality in the arts in, in, in the arts in the art studio that um, I'm not alone. Um, when I use the term "we," uh, I have somebody here next to me. Somebody might see this and say, "Okay, here we're next to somebody who's had too much turpentine in his life, and he's a bit crazy." But um, I truly believe in the presence of a, of a supreme being. Uh, I don't believe that this supreme being has a human form, but it's an energy. It's a creative energy. Creative energy that flows constantly. That's the true uh, master. The way this master works in our life and its colors and its palette um, are the people and the situations that surround us and when you actually think about the master's palette the master's palette is that master that's next to you that walks through life with you and opens and closes the doors he or she or it opens a door for one to go through and learn but once one learned that door will be shut so there can be a new beginning i have that essence uh present every day that i open shop and open the studio um in my studio one of the things that is very important is to give when one comes to the studio it's very important to give everything that I know because that that I'm giving wasn't mine it was given to me I'm just the keeper who's holding it momentarily for when that student comes that he or she knows what to do with it I am supposed to give it to him. That's what Mr. Conroy did with me with those magical tubes. He gave. When Sister Lillian would come with, with the cake uh, in the napkin and she would give it to me, she would give. She would give symbolically something that would help me eat, just like Mr. Conroy gave me some magical tubes, which would open doors. When Nancy, my high school teacher, gave me the opportunity to see the world in a different way, she gave. When I look back in my life, every person within every piece of the puzzle, this puzzle we call life, 
every piece, every person that has come in contact with me has given me the opportunity to hold certain information that I don't know how, but I decide who, when, and how to give it to. But it's for that information to keep going forward. We have to understand that when we come to this world, we come bare and naked with nothing. And when we leave, we leave with nothing. If we look at our ego and we decide that what we have is ours and ours only, those things that were given die. Sometimes I think about nature. What would happen if nature had an ego and decided that, okay, I'm going to decide that there's not going to be no more oranges. It's not going to be any more people. It's not going to be any more... Uh, no, there's going to be people. If nature decides, okay, I'm not going to let it rain anymore. I'm dying. I'm taking rain with me. I'm taking apples with me. I'm taking whatever it wants to take with it. Can you imagine what would happen to this world if there would be no rain? That's the interesting thing about the master. The master does not have an ego and doesn't keep things to him or herself or itself. It gives and gives and gives. And that's what we do here in the studio. We give and we give and we give. That's the way I work. If I could ask one question to each and all of my students, I would like for that question to be one and that one question for it to be all. How has the studio at art changed your life after you've come in contact with it? That would be my, my, my question. I mean, how was your life before and after? wow, I would really love to do this. I would really love to draw this way. And it was like a going away gift from life. That drawing stood with me until I started college. I lost track of it. Those things that you, you, you don't give that much importance. You keep, as a child you keep it, but as you grow up, and then it just disappeared. But it was enough to say, you have to go this way. Well, we used to live at, in, in an apartment complex, and it was like a melting pot of all cultures, people from different nationalities. We had, um, within our crew, there were kids who, who, who were really great at sports, others in literature, um, others in music, and I was the one who always drew and, and drew and drew. At the beginning, it wasn't very easy, um, but before leaving Uruguay, there's, there's an interesting part to this story is that I was born uh, across the street from the art studio of a Uruguayan artist. In the studio, he had an academy where he taught. The day we were le leaving to the United States, we left to the United States because my, 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 my parents uh, wanted to seek um, new frontiers and 
when we were leaving before getting into the car to go to the airport I picked up a drawing and this drawing that I picked up was the face of a man who was dreaming and in that dream there was a limousine there was a beautiful woman there was a lot of money and all that was within this cloud in a dream and I looked at the paper and I said hey, my way of communicating to my teacher, to my friends, to my students, my, my fellow students. Drawing was the and is the most important way of communication in my life. I think I was about 10 years old, uh, not sure if it was between 9 and 11. Dad shows up one day from work and he had this possibility of, of getting alone and we could actually have our, our first home. We moved into this this beautiful little house, uh, three bedroom home uh, with a backyard. And we constructed a shed with dad. And it was really beautiful. And one of the interesting things was that dad worked at the Venezuelan embassy. And while working at the Venezuelan embassy, he met a friend of which um, this friend, he gave him the basement. But when I started school my first year, it was very difficult because I came from a country which I spoke Spanish. And I was in this classroom. I did not understand the language. I didn't know how to communicate in this language, this new language. And I had to use my drawing to basically tell the other people, both teacher and students, uh, what was going through my mind. And drawing from the beginning, I think it all started in first grade. Um, in first grade is when I started to use this drawing. And I remember it, when I was alone in my solitude, I would go to this drawing that, that I picked up before leaving my country and I would look at it and I would draw it and redraw it and redraw it and never would be the same I mean I was a child I would, would never be the same as, as something that an adult would draw but um, art was my, my One of the questions I always ask a person when they come to the studio is I ask them, what do you see? And they look at the hand and it's like 99.9% .9 of the people that come to the studio, they say, I see a hand. I'm like, okay, we're going to have to change that. I was born in Montevideo, Uruguay, South America. My parents were Italian immigrants. And I stayed in Uruguay until the age of five. At the age of five, uh, my parents decided to migrate to the United States, where 